Okay, so we may be going live for a second, guys, so just uh, stand by. Well, we've never had technology problems okay, here before. So we may be going live for a second, guys, so just uh, stand by. And live we are for people who are tuning in now. We're just getting our ducks in order. When the quacking stops, we'll be uh, starting, and that should be in a few minutes. Okay, I have got 30 seconds to make sure my door is closed to this room. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, what will be the first Crowfoot Village Family Practice COVID date night. Um, it's uh, great that you've signed on. My name is Rick Ward. I'm uh, one of the physicians here at Crowfoot Village Family Practice, and I'll be the ringmaster uh, for the next hour and a half. Um, about a week and a half ago, uh, the docs were sitting around saying, uh, boy, we're not seeing as many patients face to face. We're getting lots of questions when we do provide virtual care. Um, it would be really cool if there was a way to reach out to our patients en masse and be able to communicate with them about some of our thoughts about what's happening with the COVID academic and how it's impacting our medical home and how we know it's impacting you. So through the technology and through face uh, time and uh, all the stuff that's uh, happening that's brought us here. Uh, we thought we would invite a few of our patients and uh, we were uh, really thrilled that uh, over 1100 of you have joined us for tonight. So we want to try to make this as interactive as possible. We want to try and get all, across as much information and answer as many of those questions as we could. Um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but it takes a, a village to run Crowfoot Village Family Practice, and uh, and uh, we've got a village uh, that's here to help and uh, answer uh, the questions that have come up. So let me introduce the people who are online, and uh, I'm going to start with Dr. Wendy Stefanik. Uh, Wendy uh, can give a wave in a couple of seconds. She is uh, the vice chair of our physician board and uh, has been a physician here for lots of years. And uh, again, I'm sure that many of you will recognize her. Uh, I would also like to uh, introduce uh, doc uh, Dr. No, we won't. Uh, Cheryl Withy, who is our, uh, one of our uh, all-star nurses here. Cheryl has also been around for quite a while. She's looking very unnurse like today, but <laughs> she's gonna give you a bit of a wave and uh, she's gonna uh, give you some good information from uh, the nursing uh, standpoint. Uh, speaking of uh, nurses, uh, we've got our all-star nurse practitioner, uh, Wendy Keller. Uh, Wendy, again, uh, give uh, a wave. Uh, Wendy has played a really key role in our clinic, uh, doing a lot of women's health, and uh, it's great that she can be here tonight to help us with uh, some of the issues uh, in, that, uh, in that arena. Um, We've also got uh, Janet Reynolds, and uh, Janet is our medical director, um, and uh, she also holds a leadership position with uh, Calgary Foothills um, uh, Primary Care Network, where she's the medical director there as well. So her LinkedIn profile is uh, just about as long as uh, my arms uh, span. So uh, Janet's going to uh, bring us some good information uh, about what's happening at Crowfoot, but also uh, maybe from the primary care network uh, perspective. Um, let's see, who else have we got? You know, we've got, a, yeah, oh, okay, we've got um, Care Bear. So um, uh, Karen Siegel, who uh, again, uh, give a wave, uh, Karen. Uh, Karen works with me in the Yellow Pod. Uh, she's one of our, uh, again, our physician partners. 
uh, who also works at uh, Health Quality Council and has been uh, a real leader in, uh, in helping with the information and understanding how information um, is tied in with our healthcare and looking for health improvements. Uh, we've got a token guy with me too. I didn't realize how imbalanced this was, uh, Ian. Uh, so Ian Johnson, uh, who uh, is uh, one of our uh, new young doctors, uh, I like that because his hairline is almost about the same place as mine. Uh, Ian uh, is uh, joining us uh, as well for some, uh, some great information. And last but not least, uh, from the halls of Crowfoot Village Family Practice Administrative Area, our intrepid Executive Director, uh, Shauna. Uh, Shauna, give a wave uh, for us uh, as well. Um, and she's going to answer some of those questions about the uh, uh, about the the mechanics of the practice and how it's relating to the rest of the healthcare environment. Uh, I should also say that behind the scenes we have uh, Dr. Casey Miller. Uh, we regrettably do not have her uh, live fed uh, tonight, but uh, Casey is going to be on the chat line, so she'll be able to answer questions that are coming in. We're gonna pick those themes up and broadcast them uh, as well. Um, so if you do have uh, some chat questions on the right side of your screen, there is an area to uh, be able to post your questions. Just a reminder, when you post those questions, the world sees them. So probably not best to uh, talk about, ask questions about your hemorrhoids or any other sort of personal issues, um, uh, just, just to put some boundaries on that one. Um, what else by intro? Uh, so the, the answers to the questions that you have tonight are going to be based on what the Crowfoot doc, nurse practitioner, nurse executive director, what their truth is as of now. We know that things are changing by the day and that what we say is the truth tonight may be totally different tomorrow. Furthermore, if you had five experts in the field for some of these questions, you would get five different answers tonight. So the science is changing, the information is changing. So accept that we're giving you our best guess and our best advice for today. Um, for those of you who say, geez, uh, they answered this question and I didn't quite get it, I wanna go back to it. We will have the frequently asked questions uh, put on a uh, document that you will be able to access through the Crowfoot Village Family Practice website tomorrow or the next day. So uh, if you're taking notes, uh, we got you covered. And finally, we're going to uh, preserve this experience for posterity. So the link for uh, this, um, the archived uh, presentation for tonight will also be available. So you can go back and rerun and see all the gaps and things that we goofed up on. That, that won't happen. All right, I wanna start off uh, the first question um, and ask uh, Wendy Stefanik. Wendy, uh, there was lots of questions about um, Crowfoot Village Family Practice. Are we still open for business? Are we still seeing patients? Uh, uh, what do I do uh, if I wanna get an appointment? Um, can you help us uh, understand uh, what's happening in this medical home right now? Yeah, thanks Dr. Ward. Uh, I'm going to talk and if, uh, you guys are having difficulty hearing me, just please give me a signal. But right now, obviously Crowfoot is open for business. Thanks to COVID-19, we've been encouraged, uh, pushed, shoved, thrown over the cliff into what we call virtual care. And I think in many ways, it's been a welcome addition to our practice repertoire. And many of you have probably had the privilege of having had a virtual appointment with one of us here. We got a lot of good questions, uh, received a lot of excellent questions about how to, how to call in and book an appointment, what that's going to look like, and then how you will manage uh, things like routine physicals, driver's license medicals, uh, checkups for your kids. And so I'm, I'm gonna jump right in and uh, start with a great question we got about uh, just booking a routine visit. So a routine checkup or a routine visit, what do I do? So if you're a patient of Crowfoot, you call the office and what's going to happen is you're gonna reach one of our, our phone staff and they're going to ask you what you're interested in booking for. And they're gonna, as usual, take a, a reasonable history and 
they will then offer you very likely, first off the bat, a phone appointment with your primary provider. There may be some exceptions to this. You may be calling in with a uh, specific clinical question that one of our nurses can help you with or one of our other staff or team members can help you with. But for the most part, you'll likely be booked with your provider for a phone appointment. And that can include uh, visits for, for anything from prescription renewals to reviewing lab results or uh, any primary new problems you have that you haven't talked to your doctor or your, your nurse practitioner about. Uh, with, with any appointment that you're calling in to book for, we can always start by phone. And so when it comes to routine physicals and booking checkups for your kids, for example, my suggestion would be uh, to call ahead, to call into the office and ask about booking an appointment to review your lab work that you may have had done already and review prescriptions you may be in need of. Likely what you've experienced is what many patients in Calgary have experienced with routine or non-urgent bookings. Uh, similar to what AHS has done is those appointments have been postponed or canceled. Uh, we're really trying to save room in the office and with the providers uh, for our patients who have more urgent concerns. So if you've had one of your routine visits or one of your routine physicals or driver's license medicals postponed or canceled, uh, we will, for physical specifically, still be able to tackle a lot of those uh, concerns you have by phone. Once you have that phone physical with us, we will then make, make a plan with you with respect to getting your prescriptions e-faxed, reviewing your blood work and talking to you about follow-up and what that might look like. For, for driver's license physicals specifically, we've had some questions with uh, regard to what do I do if my driver's physical is due now or it's due in two weeks. Um, as many of you may know, the government of Alberta has provided a, uh, an extension for uh, a 90 day extension for providing your completed driver's medical assessment. So what that means for you practically is if you go in because your driver's license has expired and you're in that age bracket or in that, that medical condition bracket where you need your medical form signed by one of us, you will have 90 days from that date of renewal to provide the actual medical document. The exception to this will be our, our higher risk patients and uh, those patients will probably still be required to provide that medical document at the time of renewal. So if your date of renewal falls during this COVID restriction period, then that is something you will talk to the Crowfoot staff about and we will work with you to get you in safely and have you, uh, have you assessed so that you can have that medical document in hand. Uh, examples of those patients would be our patients who recently had a stroke, patients who have recently had a heart attack, our patients who have epilepsy uh, and really need to touch base with their provider on a regular basis. Uh, if, um, you know, if there's anything that can't be handled over the phone with respect to other appointments, then again, our staff and our docs will triage you safely and get you into the clinic if need be. You will be uh, put through our COVID screening questions and uh, I'm sure many of you have already done a lot of online assessing and, and reviewing of the health link information. So you will probably be getting a little bit tired of being asked those questions, but that's um, what we're gonna do to continue to keep our Crowfoot environment safe. Some questions came through about lab work and uh, whether the labs are open, can I go for routine labs? There are some patient service centers or labs that are actually closed right now hopefully just temporarily, but we don't know how long that's going to be. So check online if you're planning to head to the lab. The labs are open for business, but they are asking that any lab test that's non-urgent that can be postponed uh, to please do so. So urgent labs that uh, we talk to you about on the phone and ask you to go for, we're going to make that pretty clear to you. Uh, other patients, so for a lot of our patients in the audience uh, who are getting tests done like INRs to check their blood thin, uh, blood thinner levels or, or any other medication that's needing adjustment or monitoring. We're going to make that pretty clear to you that we need you to get that lab done. Uh, there, there are no COVID swabs, as far as I know, nasal pharyngeal swabs done at the lab. That is a question that came across as well. So those nasal pharyngeal swabs, to my knowledge, and somebody else can comment if they know otherwise at this point, can uh, um, 
go through the 811 or uh, well first online assessment tool get triage to 811 and then you would be directed to uh, a center that can safely do your nasal pharyngeal swab and dr ward i'm gonna say that probably sums up um, the questions on my list here for how to access care in general at crowfoot and what to do about urgent non-urgent appointments I don't know if there are any questions coming across there or anybody has anything else to add. No, that's, uh, that's great, Wendy, but I uh, may want to go to our, uh, uh, our other Wendy in the panel, um, Wendy Keller, nurse practitioner. Um, some questions about um, uh, uh, women who are getting regularly scheduled appointments for prenatal visits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have things changed in, in terms of that? Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, yes, they have. Um, we're doing a lot more visits, similar to what we're doing tonight, uh, virtual visits, um, so far by phone and soon also by video. Uh, in general, we're, you know, still needing to provide antepartum care for our pregnant ladies, but minimizing their risk of exposure as well. Um, in general, in-person visits, uh, can be reduced to probably every six weeks or so. And um, initial visits, when someone first finds out they're pregnant, a lot of that we can start over the phone, uh, obtaining basic history information. Um, it's important for our pregnant ladies to have our, uh, ideally our Bright Squid secure email access so we can arrange uh, routine prenatal blood work and also um, ultrasound requisitions and send them directly to our patients. Um, as far as ultrasounds go, um, most ladies, uh, if they're low risk, can have uh, usually between two or three ultrasounds the entire pregnancy. Um, if women do become more high risk or COVID positive, they'll have much uh, more frequent ultrasounds. And other items that would be helpful for women to have uh, would be uh, a home blood pressure cuff so they could check their blood pressure at home, a uh, scale so they could also uh, weigh themselves at home, and also um, we can even provide instructions later on in pregnancy for women to measure their, um, their growing bellies, uh, known as their synthesis fundal height, even themselves at home. Uh, but of course, a few visits will need to be in person, uh, including the ultrasounds uh, later in pregnancy, you know, we're checking cervixes and whatnot as well. So um, a few changes, but overall, uh, women will have the same antepartum care. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. I want to ask uh, a few sort of uh, Crowfoot related questions, and then I'm going to pivot over and uh, we've got some real hard questions including what to do about Easter dinner for uh, Dr. Ian. So um, Nurse Cheryl, I wanna start with you and uh, just ask, um, so um, are we still open for business uh, for things like urinary tract infections? I mean, if I have a medical problem that's not COVID-19 related, uh, can I still call? I wanna hear from you. Um, so we understand our patients continue to have issues as they have in the past. And we wanna address those issues in a timely manner. So please call the clinic as concerns arise. Don't, don't stockpile things to talk about all at once, but as things come up, we certainly wanna hear from you. As usual, the phone staff will gather information to best determine um, how we can address your concerns. Sometimes this will be that an RN will give you a call and we'll have a chat. And sometimes it will be that we'll make an appointment with the physician. Uh, rarely the doctors will bring you in if you've been screened properly and you'll be assessed in the clinic. But we are definitely open for business. We definitely want to see you. Um, urinary tract infections, sinusitis, conjunctivitis. Um, even if you're, you're worried about, I don't know where to get my groceries. Um, I need some help, I need someone to talk to. The RNs are very happy to talk to you. 
We have 15 RNs on staff and we are learning new things every day and learning better how to assess you. And we just really welcome talking to you. So please call in, speak with the phone staff and if necessary, they'll send you through to one of the RNs. That's my- <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Cheryl. That's, uh, that's really good. And I, I, you know, you brought up uh, an important point that I, I just want to highlight. Uh, health is more than just um, uh, runny noses, coughs, blood pressures, prostate exams. Uh, it really does include all those other things about food security, um, about, uh, about loneliness, about mental health issues. So um, we really want to emphasize that we're your medical home. And if you're having challenges in those areas, um, if we don't have the resources in-house, uh, we know who to call. So uh, please uh, uh, do, uh, uh, do lean on us uh, for those kinds of resources and supports. Cheryl, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, and I think everybody in Calgary is now self-monitoring and thinking, <clears throat> now, is this a cough? Is this the start of COVID? And I've got a bit of a stuffy nose. Is that the cat got too close? So if you're having mild upper respiratory cold-like symptoms, who are you gonna call? That's a great question. I even think about that myself um, on occasion. It's like, well, is that a sniffle or is that not a sniffle? So what we recommend is that you go online and do the self-assessment at the myhealth.alberta.ca. That will be a good timely way to get the information that you need to know if you need to call 811 to know if you need to self-isolate. Um, I don't want people waiting uh, for Monday morning to call the clinic to figure out if they need to be self-isolating. So please do the self-assessment on myhealth.alberta.ca and um, make the right decisions quickly. Yeah, and I, uh, we're coming up to a long weekend and we know that uh, that, that website is gonna be well used at, uh, at AHS and we know that a lot of people will be calling HealthLink. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, our, uh, our medical director and the uh, Calgary Foothills uh, medical director, uh, Janet Reynolds. Um, Janet, is there a connection between HealthLink and Crowfoot? And if I do call HealthLink and uh, they say, geez, maybe you've got COVID, is there a connection back to the medical home? I, thanks for that one, Rick. I think it's a trick question, is it? <laughs> it's a hard um, <laughs> It is a hardball question. So HealthLink as a provincial resource is overwhelmed, fielding well over 11,000 calls a day in this pandemic. And it is very difficult for those nurses and the staff at HealthLink to um, know what Dr. Reynolds works where and am I the one in Edmonton or the one in Calgary? So right now they're, uh, they're struggling uh, to make connections to patient medical homes uh, for our patients. We're working really hard to, to help HealthLink at the primary care network level in Calgary to make those connections a little bit more easily. Um, and that's probably the best answer for today. Again, hopefully if we're having this conversation soon next week, there's a new answer. Um, that doesn't stop you from doing self-assessment online and giving us a call yourself so that uh, you can reach out directly and know we're here for you. All right, now for the real tough questions. Um, Ian, uh, we've got somebody who uh, their family wants to get together for Easter dinner on Sunday. There's 15 of them that are coming together. They're doing the math with social distancing uh, they want you to be the arbitrator. Um, what's the verdict on whether you should get together with your family of 15 for Easter dinner on Sunday? Thanks, Rick. I, I'll, I'll start off by, uh, first of all, apologizing. I, I am speaking English just in case anyone has trouble understanding what I'm, I am saying. Um, and yes, my, my background of coming from another country will probably help answer this question. Um, so my, my parents live in Spain. And um, I've been wonderfully locked down for quite some time now, uh, but it really hasn't changed how we interact. We do we do this. We talk, you know, they talk to their grandkids over the, over an internet connection while the grandkids run off and pay no attention. So really, there's lots of ways that you guys can get together. And I think at the moment, just reading clearly the public health advice, I would have to say that that sort of gathering is just not. A good idea at the moment. Um, 
really if they're all part of your household you know so if, if 15 of you all live together then that would reasonably with, within the the recommendations at the moment but otherwise even if they've all been self-isolating appropriately I think there's a great risk to anyone in the house so this was sent in by by someone who was obviously in the the older age group and so you know you're yourself your husband your family and even the greater community and thinking about our healthcare providers in the hospital so honestly i would say do do this zoom is free you can use stuff like this to um to talk to the whole family no matter where they are um and and have those connections yeah you might not all be eating the same dinner but it'll save an awful lot of work and why don't you have the celebration together uh, later on in the year rather than having I, I'm sorry to say it like this, but maybe some some bad things to to think about if if we have had a bad outcome somewhere. So uh, this this is real. This is serious, and I think at the moment we just all need to we all need to just stay home as much as we possibly can. So, uh, Ian, now that you've been the the bearer of uh, bad news, let yeah. me uh, uh, ask uh, something where maybe there's a bit of leeway. Um, we've got a question that says, look. Uh, can my wife and I go out for a drive together and, and be in the same car together? Uh... Yeah, and I think again that one is it's probably it's probably going a little bit too much. It would, we're saying at the moment that really it should be an essential reason to leave the house. So I probably would go so far as to say that wouldn't be recommended as well. And if we look at some of the restrictions that are in place in other jurisdictions, I mentioned my parents in Spain, they, they're allowed to go to their, their closest grocery store, one of them, and come straight home again. That is, that is the sort of restrictions that could be coming down the line for us if we're not smart and sensible about just doing the minimum at the moment. Uh, the... I think it was the New Zealand health minister had to call himself an idiot uh, because he had breached uh, their their own recommendations, which and he'd gone for a drive to the beach with his family. Um, so I think we just need to be smart, be sensible, stay home as much as we can. Um, and I, I can guarantee you from the bottom of my heart, my uh, my healthcare uh, colleagues, um, I, I see this all the time on FaceTime uh, on Facebook rather from the UK. We really appreciate all that you're doing to keep us safe and keep our colleagues and friends safe in the hospital. So please keep up the good work. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I'm looking for a silver lining in here and I think I'm gonna go to uh, Wendy Keller. Um, uh, Wendy, with all this uh, stay at home stuff uh, and Netflix getting a bit tiring, uh, we've got somebody uh, who has said, uh, hey, uh, is this a bad time to start thinking about having babies? Uh, any uh, contraindication to uh, procreation uh, at this time? Um, there's a, a little bit of leeway on this one. Um, it basically depends on how comfortable uh, you are with risk. Um, there is some risk involved if you do become pregnant and become COVID positive. And um, so overall, it would be safer to possibly wait a few months, you know, maybe into the summer when our numbers are a little bit less. Um, should I talk about the specific risks involved, Rick, or save that for later? Only if it's good news. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, overall, the, the news is better than expected for pregnant women. Um, Compared to non-pregnant women who are the same age, uh, the risk of actually getting infected is the same. Uh, once they are infected, the risk of severe illness, i.e. having to be in an intensive care unit, is actually also the same as non-pregnant women their same age. Um, in the first trimester specifically, uh, the theoretical risk of a COVID positive patient um, is if they have a very high fever that's uncontrolled. Um, that can lead to increased risk of miscarriage uh, and congenital uh, abnormalities, especially neural tube type defects like spina bifida. Um, however, pregnant women can safely take Tylenol or acetaminophen in order to control their uh, fevers. Later on in pregnancy, second and third trimester, 
um, COVID positive women are primarily at increased risk of um, if they do develop pneumonia. Um, and depending on the severity of their pneumonia can go into labor early or um, their, you know, their water can break early. Uh, they also would then have an increased risk of developing uh, complication with higher blood pressure or preeclampsia and abnormalities in their fetal heart rate uh, would lead them also with increased risk of ultimately having a C-section. Um, but the data that they've studied, um, 60 positive pregnant women uh, in China who were COVID positive, uh, the pneumonia that they developed was mild to moderate. So that seems to be the key is the severity of their pneumonia. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just mention uh, the unborn babies. Um, so far they have found are not becoming infected you know, while the mother is pregnant. So uh, also known as vertical transmission is, is not happening. Um, so that's good news for the, for our babies. So overall, I would suggest maybe waiting a bit. Yeah, thanks. Okay, but I'm again, looking for that silver lining. <laughs> but if you're feeling okay, and you're not planning on having babies, it's probably okay to be together Would that is that an okay statement yes 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 um yeah and if you're not wanting to make babies you know remember your contraception as well which we're available to provide prescriptions and, and do phone appointments for things like that as well yeah. right on the director is saying change the subject it's still <laughs> uh, still family time <laughs> Um, I just want to take a minute to talk about uh, the mental health consequences and how people are feeling emotionally. Uh, as I've talked to patients, as I've talked to colleagues um, over the last two weeks, um, I think everybody is feeling some degree of fear and apprehension. Uh, and I mean, that's everybody in the world. I was just uh, looking at the Johns Hopkins site and we've got over 1.5 million people diagnosed in the world with uh, COVID-19 illness and, and uh, it's multiple times of that of people who uh, have not been diagnosed. So I think that uh, feelings of anxiety, feelings of tension, feelings of hopelessness are absolutely appropriate for where we are right now. Um, so I think normalizing the fact that we're all feeling that way. Uh, Cheryl uh, talked about how we're all feeling hypervigilant. We're all checking our symptoms and wondering, um, um, you know, whether we're coming down with that. Um, Crowfoot put out a series of 10 mental health tips to be able to help um, patients de-escalate or relax or stress out or chill out. So I'd encourage you to look at those for some really practical tips to help you um, maybe rebalance uh, some of those uh, negative emotions. I'd also like to announce that uh, Crowfoot is actually um, uh, putting together some resources to be able to provide some mental health support uh, for patients that feel that they need uh, some extra boosters. Uh, stay tuned in the next week, but what we're looking at is maybe some group medical appointments by Zoom, similar to the technology that, uh, that we're using in presentation, so that you can get some really practical tips for coping uh, and for rebalancing uh, from a, uh, a psychologist. So stay tuned uh, for that uh, in the next, uh, next short time. The other point I'd like to make before I, uh, I invite Karen Siegel to uh, answer this uh, next question is, is that um, for four out of five people who get COVID illness, this is a mild condition. It's like a mild cold or virus that you may have two or three times for the, through the year. So if we focus in on, on some of the news feed and the catastrophization that we're seeing, uh, it's easy to get wrapped up into seeing COVID as being this awful, horrible thing that's gonna wipe us all out. This is an important disease and it's important that we flatten the curve by following all the measures that Ian has talked about. But for the majority of people who get this illness, and I've had a number who I've been in touch with uh, who are our patients uh, and they say this is no big deal. 
So we're talking about that one in five that will have a more concerning course. Um, uh, we've had some uh, really um, difficult but important questions that uh, people have been asking about. Uh, I am in a high risk category. If this was to happen to me, uh, um, what, what about my wishes around going to hospital and, and advanced care? Um, Karen Siegel, can I ask you to, uh, to address that, uh, that question? Thanks, Rick. Um, it's a really important topic, actually, so I'm happy that uh, somebody brought that up. I I'd start off by just uh, reiterating what you said, which is that the vast majority of people will actually have a mild illness, um, and we estimate that a small proportion will have a severe illness and um, potentially require ventilator support, um, but we don't know who those people are. And so it's a great idea to think about it now in terms of what you might want for your care. Um, I'd also point out uh, that based on the estimates that uh, Premier Kenny had announced yesterday and, and discussed further today, um, we anticipate that we will certainly have enough hospital beds and ICU beds and ventilators for those who need it. And so I don't think we'll be getting to the point where we have to pick and choose who gets ventilators, as they've had to do, unfortunately, in other countries. Um, again, as long as we keep doing all the things that public health is asking us to do. Um, but I do think it is extremely important for all of us, regardless of age and health conditions, uh, to think about what's important to us and what we would want if the situation were to come up for, for any of us. Um, and there are ways to communicate those things to people so that if the situation does come up, we have a bit of a plan. So the first thing really would be to identify what we call a substitute decision maker. So that's somebody who can make decisions on your behalf if for some reason you can't do that yourself. Um, so the first part is to identify that person and really it should be somebody who can um, speak for you even in the chaos of a, a scary situation. And the second important part would be to communicate to that person. Um, we certainly don't want that person to be identified but not know that that's, that's who they are. Um, and so just to really have a conversation with that person and, and, and other loved ones in your, in your life to have a conversation about what would I want in, in this type of scenario. Um, there are resources that can help you do this. Um, certainly your medical home, your, your team at Crowfoot uh, can, can help you with that. Um, and I'm hoping to put some more information up on our website about that as well. That was a really great question to thanks to whoever brought that up. Um. Thanks, Karen. Um, it is an important topic and uh, one that uh, I, I know in my practice with my patients, uh, I don't address proactively enough. Uh, and it's times like this that uh, it is helpful to uh, have that uh, important talk. Um, Ian, I'm gonna come back to you with, uh, with another, can I do this doctor question. Uh, a solo bike ride uh, in the country. Um, I think we may have one day of spring tomorrow. Um, is it okay uh, if uh, our patient goes out for a bike ride? Yeah, honestly, we the if you take what they're saying in the UK, which is that each of us can go outside to do exercise once a day, um, then that's okay. What I would say is take my um, my my bit more conservative hat and put it on for a second and just take take it's a time to take you know extra caution it's not the time to be doing your your biggest ride or taking extra risks you know you don't want to end up needing the the services of the of the um of, of ems or whatever uh, so yeah i think going out and getting some exercise is good good for all of us good for our mental health and um because you're you're going to be staying two meters away from everyone else so that i think that would be absolutely fine right um, I'm going to take a, a question from the chat line. Uh, Colleen asked about uh, when, um, when is this going to be over? Uh, I mean, one of the contradictions about flattening the peak is, is that the more we practice social distancing, uh, the longer that we, um, the, more, the more that we delay transmission between people, um, the longer the disease is going to exist at a low level. So right now, the um, uh, the modeling that we're doing at AHS, and I, I uh, hang around with AHS uh, in, in a position there, so know some of uh, the thinking. 
is uh, the first couple of weeks in May. So um, if you're wondering when could this all be over, uh, should I be thinking about uh, um, a long weekend camping trip in May? Uh, I, I think that's unlikely right now. I think that we're um, IMO, uh, that this is, is looking at going uh, until the summer. There's also been some questions about resources and I have to say that uh, this province has done an extremely good job at being prepared for this. Again, I've been involved behind the scenes in the planning that's happening and the passion uh, of my colleagues at AHS and, and the thoughtfulness. Um, I've also heard that, uh, that we've got uh, an incredible storage of ventilators. Uh, we hope that, that we can uh, leave them in mothballs, but right now there is no signals of uh, resource shortages in, um, in, uh, in the hospital care. Um, there's an incredible mobilization of manpower. A couple of my uh, uh, semi-retired or retired uh, patients uh, uh, have asked about uh, coming back into the battle. And so it's, it's been a very, uh, very rewarding uh, to see so many people step up uh, to be able to fight this pandemic. So I think that, um, you know, as a member of the public, you can be very much reassured uh, that the system is there and that the system has, uh, has, uh, has got you covered. Speaking of the system and, and government coverage and so on, um, uh, we thank, thank you that there's been a lot of questions that came in prior to the event and some questions tonight saying, um, what is the impact of all these uh, doctors cuts and uh, the conflict uh, and tension with doctors? What impact is that having on uh, Crowfoot Village? And let me turn things over to, uh, to Sean at home, who uh, is gonna uh, give us uh, some insight into our model and, and what impact uh, the political environment is having on us. Yeah, uh, thanks Rick. And I uh, echo Rick's, Rick's comments. Thank you so much for asking those questions and for thinking of us. Um, for the benefit of all of you tuning in tonight, uh, if you're not aware, um, at CVFP, we're actually paid differently than most family physicians in Alberta. Typically, a physician bills the province every time they see a patient, and that's called fee-for-service. At CVFP, we're paid an annual amount per patient, no matter how often we see you during the year. We began piloting this model of funding in 1999, um, and we've worked the past 20 plus years uh, to design a delivery model uh, that results in improved health outcomes and reduced use of emergency and inpatient visits for our patients. We've been working with the government to expand our model and offer it to family physicians in Alberta. And we often share our learnings and our processes with other family medicine clinics. So to be clear, the government hasn't made any changes to our funding model. The changes the government is making will not impact your care or service delivery at CVFP. One of the questions that often accompanies concerns about the cuts is what can our patients do for us? One of the best things you can do for your health is have a family doctor. CVFP is your medical home where not only do you have a family doctor, but you have a team of health professionals caring for you. We know you, we know your family, and we have access to your medical records. So what you can do for us is call us first. If you need care, we are here for you. And I think the other thing you can do, and I'll reiterate what Rick and Ian have both said, is the best thing you can do right now is stay home, practice physical distancing, with social connection, help us flatten the curve and keep you and your loved ones safe and healthy. Thanks, Shauna. And uh, a shout out to Shauna and the administrative team and the people behind the scenes at Crowfoot. Um, you know, as, uh, as the family docs and uh, I'll throw a nurse practitioner in here. Uh, you know, we're often the point people for uh, the thanks and the appreciation uh, but um, really our job is easy. Uh, the coordination that happens to be able to provide the care uh, and the staff uh, that do it um, uh, is really a part of what makes this uh, medical home uh, what it is today. So uh, uh, it's nice to be able to publicly acknowledge uh, the rest of our team. Wendy, uh, what are those rotten pharmacists doing uh, not giving me more than a month worth of my medication. Is this uh, a conspiracy to uh, get more dispensing fees uh, or is there something behind that? 
No, it's a it's another great question. And what the uh, pharmacy pharmacists association of Alberta has encouraged and quite frankly um, expected of all of the pharmacists in the province is to ensure that everybody has great access to their prescriptions, their medications, uh, and that there is no shortage and no need to stockpile. In order to do that, what they've asked pharmacists to do is to ensure that every patient gets a 30-day pres uh, prescription or supply of their medication. And in doing so, they're ensuring that the supply chain in Alberta for prescription medications remains robust and this, this will provide an adequate supply for everybody uh, for, for the long term. Uh, there are lots of different ways uh, pharmacists can do this if medications are uh, running short. And in particular, even pre-COVID, we have had some supply issues with uh, specifically certain blood pressure medications. And pharmacists are, as many of you are probably already aware of, are really uh, equipped and, and very knowledgeable uh, with adapting your prescription to give you something that is just as effective as uh, what you were on before. If that prescription is perhaps running lower, they can't give you that full 30-day supply. Uh, particular priority uh, you know, really is needed for our, our patients with chronic diseases because we know our patients with chronic diseases are potentially at more risk of of uh, developing complications from a COVID-19 infection. And so uh, they, your pharmacist, if, if there is any doubt of the supply of your medication can definitely help you troubleshoot that. So the pharmacists are in fact doing what we uh, are, well, we're very happy and relieved they're doing. We don't wanna have a toilet paper situation where we get a lot of stockpiling and we have a shortage and uh, and then we're in dire straits or many of our patients are in dire straits at a time when it's really important to uh, maintain optimal health, keep your chronic medical conditions under good control. And uh, I have not heard of any inhaler shortages. There was a question about inhalers. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has, but certainly this is not the time to be running out of those either. We know asthma is an underlying uh, respiratory condition can put patients at increased risk. So again, uh, another great reason for our pharmacists to be implementing the 30-day supply so that everybody has enough of what they need for, for the duration. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. And uh, I, uh, speaking of team, it would be uh, remiss of me not to uh, uh, also do a shout out to our great uh, primary care network multidisciplinary team. And uh, one of our all-stars, uh, Esmond Wong, has uh, come to the defense of his uh, fellow pharmacists and uh, has put in the chat line that they've actually reduced the uh, dispensing fee or copay um, uh, for seniors. And you can read the text for the details, but um, reinforce Wendy's uh, comment on my tongue in cheek uh, um, intro to this uh, saying that the pharmacists were doing something. This is not about that at all. And I think the concept is, um, you know, we don't want to have happen with your blood pressure or diabetes medication with what's happening with toilet paper, uh, where you go to the pharmacist for your insulin and they say, well, geez, somebody just walked out with uh, two years supply. So I think it's a rational move. I know it, it does create some inconvenience, but um, uh, I think it really is uh, for the greater good. Um, I mentioned primary care networks and I've mentioned it a couple of times and uh, I'm gonna call on uh, Janet Reynolds again and her expertise uh, to um, maybe explain what a primary care network is, how it's different from Crowfoot, and how the primary care network is part of the system of providing support uh, for patients uh, during this pandemic. Thanks again, Rick, and also thanks for the little uh, up-to-date information with the uh, health link. It's just back to my previous question. Um, Coming soon, HealthLink will be working uh, to get information to family doctors. Um, if you do call HealthLink with uh, any kind of illness, including COVID-like symptoms. Um, so primary care networks are broader than your patient's medical home. They're um, clusters of physicians who gather together um, that bring funding into a big group where we can, uh, to, 
to develop supports for team-based care in your doctor's office. So the staff that you might see above and beyond Esmond, the pharmacist who's on the chat line, might be our behavioral health consultant or BHC um, that's helping us provide mental health. It could be a health management nurse. And, and the network is more of your patients, uh, our patients' medical community. Um, so it's just a bit broader than our clinic um, and helps us provide that support to our patients. Um, thanks, Janet, that's, uh, that's uh, um, really helpful. Uh, the other comments that have come up, uh, and again, uh, a couple of my patients uh, I know have, have put notes in the chat line, is about the, the whole concept of uh, um, uh, chloroquine. Um, it's gotten a lot of press and certainly there's a lot of controversy about it. Um, and there's concern from patients who are on chloroquine now for uh, autoimmune diseases and other things that are saying, what if we run out? And so um, uh, there is sensitivity around that. Uh, I, I see uh, Randy Howden uh, has joined, who's our community pharmacist that works uh, in the med shop down below us. And uh, Randy, if you've got any comments on uh, if you see any challenges with uh, getting a chloroquine uh, for our patients, then please put that into the chat line. It's information I don't have. Um, I will say, and it was announced uh, publicly today, I believe, that there is going to be a, a clinical trial that's happening in, um, uh, in Calgary with uh, Luen Metz, uh, uh, a neurologist who's uh, a real leader, um, is uh, one of the principal investigators. And so there is going to be a clinical trial for people with COVID disease uh, 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 with chloroquine. You know, it, it's, there is some promise, the, the science that I've seen, there is some promise uh, but this does not look like the magic bullet. Uh, this does not look like something that we should all have some on hand. Uh, very tentative um, evidence, um, uh, studies that have shown some benefit, but it, it's small numbers um, and, uh, and not a slam dunk at all. And just looking to see whether there's anything from Randy yet, but uh, nothing that I have seen. Um, just want to uh, ask um, about uh, newborns. Um, uh, Wendy Keller, um, uh, newborns and breastfeeding, is there a contraindication if you're developing um, respiratory symptoms that could be COVID disease? Uh, should, um, should mom stop breastfeeding or is there a big risk to, uh, to newborns? Uh, the recommendation is for women to continue to breastfeed, whether they are confirmed COVID positive or whether they're showing symptoms and awaiting test results. Um, women can use the same precautions that everyone else, uh, as far as hygiene, good hand washing, uh, washing their breasts with soap and water prior to feeding, and can also wear masks uh, during uh, breastfeeding, um, the risk is uh, the risk of droplet transmission to the newborn uh, is what um, in order to prevent the baby to become infected. And as I mentioned before, uh, they have so far found babies are not becoming infected, you know, during pregnancy, it's potentially after. Um, and as far as watching your newborn for signs of COVID, um, it's similar to adults. Initially, it's um, you're looking for cough and fever in your newborn. Uh, so new moms should definitely have a thermometer for their babies. Um, later symptoms in newborns, of course, are things like uh, dehydration or difficulty breathing. And that would, of course, require emergency treatment. Um, but yeah, overall, recommending moms and babies stay together in the hospital immediately and continue breastfeeding throughout. Thanks. Thanks very much, Wendy. That's, uh, that's, that's great news. Um, there was a question in the chat line about uh, naproxen or um, uh, our trade name is uh, Aleve, uh, which is in the same family as ibuprofen or Advil class of medications that are called the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or the NSAIDs. Um, 
there was a French government official who tweeted out uh, about uh, two weeks ago that uh, NSAIDs were associated with a worse outcome in patients with COVID illness. And there was a recommendation for a time that people avoid NSAIDs for that reason. <clears throat> that recommendation um, has since been put to rest by most organizations. So um, NSAIDs are felt not to be contraindicated uh, for symptomatic relief uh, of patients that have respiratory illness or COVID disease. Um, and if you are on an NSAID for arthritis or other conditions, uh, there's no indication for you to stop it. Uh, for those of you who may have picked up that um, um, uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, common medications we use for blood pressure and kidney protection, there was also some theoretical concerns about that. Uh, my classmate and good friend and world expert, Todd Anderson, who's uh, the head of uh, the vice dean now of the medical school, put this question to him uh, within the last week. And uh, that also has been, uh, been myth busted uh, so that if you are on an ACE or an ARB, uh, common medications for blood pressure, um, diabetes, uh, heart disease, then you should continue on those. Uh, so uh, that's the word as of today. Um, uh, there may be uh, new knowledge that comes up, but I think we can be reassured. Um, Ian, I've been avoiding going back to you because they, it, it all seems to be bad news. But listen, there's lots of questions about masks. Should we all be wearing them? Uh, cloth masks versus surgical masks. Uh, what's your wisdom on the use of masks? I'll, I'll try and avoid being captain of the fun police with uh, with this answer. Um, so, um, so sorry. Which uh, which question is it? Is it to how how do you make one, or is it uh, like who who should wear one and when? What do you want to know, Rick? Can we buy a mask from you? No, no, that's not the question. Uh, let's let's break it down. Should we be wearing a mask when we're in public? Will that protect me? Yeah, and so the we we've actually had lots of debate over the last few weeks, even within the clinic, about what to do about this. And uh, so let's be quite clear: it's a very controversial area. Um, the the recommendation has changed this week that um, not non medical masks. So that's not the the fancy N95 ones that even we in the clinic don't need to use. Uh, that's not the uh, the medical mask that you do see a lot of people wearing that's simply just some kind of face covering um, is what public health in Canada is now recommending that we do now the way Rick put that is is that protecting him it's not protecting the wearer the idea is it's doing a favor to all of those around you so it's to prevent um, spread of these droplets that you might not know that you're carrying it. We've hear, heard, I've, I've certainly read uh, up to 30% of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission of this virus. And so that's why uh, the public, public Health Agency of Canada, Dr. Tam came out the other day and said, wear a mask when you're out in public if you can't socially distance. So that guy that's going on his bike ride, he doesn't need to wear a mask. He needs to wear a helmet. But he doesn't need to wear a mask. Um, but um, if I'm going, to, I, so I went to the grocery store the day that uh, that came out, and I fashioned myself a mask out of a, a buff that I normally use when I go cross country skiing. I looked like I was going to rob the place. I was going to say burgle, but apparently that doesn't go very well in, uh, because of my funny accent. Um, and it was very uncomfortable. It really was. I was desperate to touch it. I was desperate to like get in about my face. And that's the, the, the concern. So although I'm putting my mask on to protect everybody else, I could potentially infect myself with whatever happens to be on my hands when I go to fit, fiddle with the mask. So if you're wearing a mask, you absolutely need to be careful that you're washing your hands before you're putting your mask on. You're not touching it once it's on and you're wa uh, washing your hands after you've put it on. And then when you take it off, same thing, wash your hands, very carefully removing it. You're not getting anywhere near your face and then washing your hands again. So it's it's, it is to an extra step in addition to social distancing and hand hygiene, 
and respiratory hygiene, which is like coughing uh, into your into your sleeve and all of that stuff, um, and staying home as much as possible. But it's absolutely not um, a, a replacement for all of those things. It's an extra measure and has to be done really carefully. Um, hopefully that uh, is enough of a, a Scottish ramble to, to answer that question. Um, I was so distracted by the question on the chat line uh, about will Scotch stop transmission of the virus that I didn't hear whether you answered this uh, question. So if I'm uh, asking you a question you've already answered, it's because I was thinking about the Scotch trial. Um, do masks worn outside protect you or do they protect other people? Yeah, so um, I, I'll touch on the Scotch thing. Certainly the deaths that are happening in Scotland so far would suggest that it's it's not. I have joked to my friends that the, the rates, when this is all done and dusted, the rates of death in Scotland will be significantly lower than the rest of the world due to the sheer number of sheer alcohol level in the blood of the population, but I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, so I, it's, it's to protect everybody else. It's not protecting me. In fact, it's potentially putting me at risk when I wear a mask because if I start touching a surface that's got uh, the, the virus on it and then I, I start fiddling with my mask, then I, I inoculate myself and potentially infect myself. All right, a lot of interest in the chat room about the, uh, the trial with Scotch. So we'll have to bring that up in the next webcast. Um, a number of people in the chat have also been saying, so who really is high risk? Um, and um, uh, Wendy Stefanik, I'm going to ask you to start that off. I know it's one of those unscripted questions and um, uh, it'll give us all a chance just to make sure that we know who the high risk group are uh, for complications of COVID-19. Oh. Um, uh, Wendy, can you start yep. us off? Yeah, so uh, great on the fly question. Uh, when I talk to my patients about who is high at high risk for COVID-19, we, uh, I am generally referring to those patients that are, um, I think the, the official age is, is 65 or over. Uh, I'm probably going to be corrected on some of these points. Uh, patients with underlying chronic diseases, patients who have, uh, so for example, autoimmune diseases, underlying respiratory conditions, um, COPD, asthma does fall into that category and we'll, we might have, we do have some questions about that that we can address shortly. And uh, right now our, our frailer elderly and our patients with multiple medical comorbidities, uh, of course, being, being our most at risk patients. And I think right now, um, the, the questions that I'm getting uh, from patients, from our patients are really uh, asking questions about, uh, I would say a lower to, to moderate risk uh, group of patients. So our patients who are very, very healthy, maybe have mild to moderate asthma or asthma that's been quite quiet for some time. All of our patients with sleep apnea who we've been uh, pushing over the last years to, to be compliant with their CPAP therapy. Uh, and and are, they, are they considered at higher risk? And what do they need to do to manage those, those respiratory conditions specifically? And so I do have some questions, Rick, I'm gonna segue into that uh, right now. And uh, so one of, the, one of the questions that has come up is, you know, what about my asthma? Does, does having mild asthma, or having been told in the past I have asthma, put me at increased risk? The, the answer to that is to some extent, yes, but really what, what I'm uh, discovering is that our patients with more moderate to severe asthma and asthma who, that isn't under good control are, are at increased risk. So going back to our comment about uh, making sure our inhaler supply is adequate, um, this is a good time to make sure your asthma is under good control. It's not a not a great time to run out of your your inhalers. And as we're heading into spring allergy season, which is a trigger for a lot of patients in Calgary for their asthma, even mild asthma, this is a, a good time to just make sure that everything uh, everything is as well managed as you can be. When it comes to our patients with asthma who test positive for COVID nineteen, if they're doing well and they're recovering from COVID at home. Uh, and that's kind of the patient group I'm, I'm referencing right now, then your, your, 
your goal with treating your asthma is to treat your asthma. You want to make sure your, your asthma is under good control. You don't have to be concerned about taking your steroid inhaler. You don't have to be concerned if you even sometimes use oral steroids to control your asthma. The best way to mitigate your risk by, uh, if you have asthma with uh, COVID-19 is to make sure you're following all of your regular uh, asthma protocols and, and making sure you're following the guidelines and keeping that disease in as good a control as possible. That's your best, best approach. Uh, lots of questions about CPAP. For our patients with, uh, with that CPAP machine, specifically, are you putting others at risk by wearing your CPAP machine at night and, and can it spread COVID-19? Uh, the answer to that is probably yes. There are droplets that are spread at night when you breathe. There is uh, some suggestion that the CPAP machine itself will increase how far those droplets spread during the nighttime, as well uh, through the exhalation tube where the carbon dioxide comes out. There is a really high chance that that virus, if you are positive for COVID-19, that that virus can be aerosolized and spread further. So. The recommendations right now are that if you have, if you have COVID-19 and you are wearing your CPAP, you should be isolating anyway, but you certainly should be isolating uh, at night as well and wearing your CPAP in a separate room from your household members. A good question that also came up about whether I, if a patient is sick and maybe they have COVID-19 or, or maybe they have COVID-19 and they're asymptomatic and don't know, uh, will the CPAP machine put others at risk as well? And again, the, the answer is the same. Uh, it's going to be, un, I think, unreasonable for every single individual that wears a CPAP machine to isolate and sleep alone at night. Um, but just be made aware that that risk is probably not zero. If you're concerned and you can't self-isolate, then you can talk to one of your docs or, or a nurse practitioner about how else you can help manage your, your sleep apnea at night. Uh, Rick, I'm gonna keep going with the sleep apnea question. I've got one more that I really wanted to, to get out there. Um, great question that came up about the potential use of CPAP as a ventilator. And uh, I did, uh, did not know this, but apparently as I'm not surprised uh, with, with this current challenge drives incredible innovation. Uh, along with lots of redesigns of ventilators to be able to mass produce more simple ventilators. They are looking at ways to uh, use CPAP as a ventilator. Specifically, you don't have to provide your own CPAP machine uh, to be available for that, but if you do have extra ones um, that aren't being used, uh, you know, that there might be an avenue for you to, to donate that, so to speak, for, um, for future use and development. Thanks, and lots of uh, great uh, comments on the chat line. Uh, Lynn H., uh, I was uh, asking uh, one of your family members uh, how you and your husband were making out uh, being uh, uh, self-isolated, uh, and I see that making surgical masks is a way to, to, to use some of that endless energy. So uh, thanks for the offer that came out about sharing those with uh, people. Um, Lots of questions about, so does the flu shot protect me? I've had the um, uh, pneumonia shot. Uh, does that give me protection? Um, hey, how about uh, CBD oil? It's good for everything, right? Um, and uh, the um, line about uh, vitamin D in the YouTube video exposing the, um, uh, the benefits of vitamin D in COVID. Uh, there is no evidence, guys. Um, there, there really isn't. Uh, I think that, um, having had the flu shot, and uh, if you've had the pneumonia uh, vaccine, uh, those will prevent you from some of the complications that can happen with uh, COVID illness. Uh, for those healthcare people, um, what I was told as of yesterday by Brandy Walker, who's uh, the respiratory doc, who's uh, doing so much work with primary care and with patients, the pneumonias that uh, people with uh, COVID illness tend to get is not the classic lobar pneumonia that we see uh, that uh, pneumococcal, um, the pneumococcal uh, shots, uh, pneumovax prevents. Uh, it's a COVID pneumonia. So it, it tends not to be the secondary pneumonias uh, from a bacterial infection. It's more uh, from the uh, COVID illness itself. Um, there was also a question about CBD oil for anxiety. And um, um, 
here's my uh, my plea with uh, using um, uh, cannabis, THC, CBD. Um, go with the stuff that we have evidence for and that we know works. Those 10 tips that we put out have huge evidence behind them uh, in terms of helping people deal with anxiety. Uh, for those of you who have underlying depression or anxiety disorders and are fine that they've been destabilized, and honestly, that represents half of the calls that I, may, that I have in a day, um, then reach out to us and talk about modifying your baseline medication. Um, again, this is a daily thing for me to walk uh, along with patients. We just don't know enough about CBD and THC in terms of the short-term or long-term effects. And particularly if you're inhaling these, we have no idea the impact of that in terms of the susceptibility for COVID. So um, that would be at the very end of my list for um, uh, strategies for dealing with um, anxiety uh, or, uh, uh, or depression. Uh, Karen, um, uh, Karen Siegel, I want to come back to you. Um, uh, there's a question that came up about modifying uh, advanced directives. So um, if you've already done your advanced directives um, and maybe you've been at an R level um, and which means uh, full resuscitation in ICU and you're thinking, you know what, um, if I was to get COVID uh, and I was starting to have health problems, I'm not sure I would want to go to the hospital. Um, can people modify their um, advanced directives? Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, absolutely, people can modify those advanced directives. In fact, we fully expect people to modify them over time as new information becomes available and as their health conditions change. And I'm talking about regardless of COVID, we expect those to change over time. Um, so um, in terms of how to do that, so at, at, at a very minimum, I would want you to communicate your desires to, to your, your loved ones if you can't speak for yourself. And uh, more importantly, it's, it's, well, I shouldn't say more importantly, but it's certainly important as well to document that. Um, it's kind of thing you might need a little bit of help with. And so that's something you can reach out to your team at CPFP to do. Um, there are specific documents that we can help you fill out um, and we can, we can walk you through it. Thanks, Karen. And we've really been um, been buoyed by uh, the response tonight. I'm told that there's uh, uh, up to 1,300 of you online tonight. So I, I think, uh, and from the comments that we've got, we really see this as an effective way to have a dialogue. Um, and, uh, and, and Karen, I'll get you to nod on this agreement. But one of the things that we've talked about uh, as a physician group um, around advanced directives and how to start to have that conversation now um, is we've talked about having another one of these uh, live webcasts uh, talking about advanced directives because there's probably a number of you there that are saying advanced what? What's this advanced directive? What's this green sleeve thing? What's this RMC code? Um, and, and Karen, is it a thumbs up from you that we should maybe uh, schedule a webcast on that in the next couple of weeks? just so that we can give that information broadly? For sure, it's not an easy topic. And so it's not a sort of a two minute answer. I think that would be a really great idea. Okay, so stay tuned for that. And, and again, we've got two things then that we're planning to do uh, in the next several weeks. One is gonna be around uh, some tips to help with the emotional impact on, uh, uh, on all of us with COVID illness. Um, and then the second is uh, going to be uh, a primer on advanced directives and some things to, to think about and to talk to your family about. Um, and we'll do that as a, a live webcast. Um, Ian, back to you. Uh, a lot of questions about transmission on inanimate objects. Um, should we be washing our toilet paper before we use it? No, that's maybe not a good example, but. Um, what about other inanimate objects, uh, fomites? Do we, do we need to be concerned about viral transmission uh, through that vector? Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to go back to what you said at the beginning, uh, Rick, about how we have very, very shaky uh, evidence base for that. I did spend some time digging into this um, this week to see if I can give you a bit of a better answer. Um, and really, 
depending on what we're talking about, um, metal, plastic, paper, cardboard, there was various different answers. And so the best I would say is it can live for a few days, particularly on things like metal and plastic. Um, someone had also asked about uh, temperature stability and like whether sticking things in the freezer or the fridge would kill it. Seems, seems it doesn't kill it. And so potentially, you know, you stick that thing from the, the grocery store in the fridge um, and it's not probably going to kill it. Um, and someone was asking about, you know, air handling systems. And I guess, yeah, theoretically, the, the virus could live on those things. But unless someone's actively like expecting, you know, coughing into your, uh, into, in, into your furnace, into your uh, air conditioning system, I wouldn't be too worried about that. It's not like um, some things we see like Legionnaires that can, uh, can live in air conditioning systems. So I wouldn't get spend too much time worrying about that. Um, simple things, you know, high traffic surfaces you know your door handles the the faucet on your on your water tap um all your countertop stuff like that front door handle stuff uh, places like that i think that's where you just want to make sure you're being a bit more diligent about washing those things down wiping them with uh, with soap and water you can make a dilute bleach solution um the american cdc website does actually have quite a a good list of all of the things you can use in the house to, to clean things, um, which uh, I think we can put into the, the show notes into the frequently asked questions uh, very easily for you guys. Um, and so really probably about three days is the, the best um, I can say because someone was asking if like, I brought a pe jar of peanut butter home. Um, but you could always, if, if you were worried enough, you could always just wipe it down um, with um, simple uh, simple things that you have in the house for doing all your day-to-day -day cleaning. Thanks, Ian. Um, a lot of questions about um, lab work, routine lab work. So let me just talk about a couple that have come up. Uh, for thyroids, those who are uh, on Synthroid or Altroxin who uh, are due to have their TSH done, uh, probably not one that is super time sensitive. Um, particularly if you've been on a stable dose of thyroid. So uh, that's one where we've got wiggle room on in most cases. Uh, INRs, uh, so for people who are on Coumadin or Warfarin uh, as blood thinners, um, that's a little bit more uh, uh, tenuous. So um, what I would say is, is that uh, the patients that I'm managing uh, their INRs, uh, in truth, it's uh, Nurse AJ that's doing the heavy lifting. Uh, I just throw in my thoughts. But for those patients, we're really trying to stretch out when safe, the frequency by which you need uh, a blood test. Um, all the routine stuff at the lab, they're really discouraging. We want those lab resources to be put towards uh, COVID testing and, uh, um, and emphasis on that. So your routine blood work um, is, um, uh, is not a high priority right now. Uh, I see Lori is uh, on the chat. I see Amy's on the chat, Randy, Esmond. So these are members of our um, multidisciplinary team who help uh, patients uh, stay healthy and maintain control over um, their uh, illnesses like diabetes, uh, high blood pressure. They are still on the job. They will still be reaching out to you, uh, um, reminding you about uh, self-care, providing answers to your questions. Um, uh, we're also going to be reaching out to some of our more vulnerable patients and, and some of you online may have gotten calls uh, already from the office. Um, we recognize that the social isolation uh, uh, is, is really a problematic for a lot of our, our high risk patients. And so um, don't be surprised if you get a call from Lori uh, or from uh, one of our, our nurses uh, or staff just as a, a checking point to see how you're doing, uh, is there any health needs? So um, we're gonna try to do that proactively. So uh, again, uh, thanks to, uh, to Lori and uh, Amy and, uh, and all of our team. Um, let's see, oh, can Mr. Clean kill the coronavirus? Um, so Ian, uh, uh, Ian sort of looks like Mr. Clean. I, <laughs> no, sorry, that's... Very handsome, exactly. You're right, Rick. Thank you very much. Um, I actually don't know what Mr. Clean has in it. Um, I suspect probably it does have uh, have a suitable uh, concentration of um, of what you need in it. But I actually 
I, I don't use it, so I don't know. I'm going to go a little bit off topic for a second and say, Juniper and Torin, I think you're still watching upstairs. It's time to get your jammies on and brush your teeth. Just thinking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all, uh, uh, all, all great points, especially the reminder about, uh, about getting to bed. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm uh, maybe just going to go around and ask all of our panel members um, uh, for one pearl that they would like to leave our audience with. Uh, so for those in the Crowfoot Village Family Practice, medical family, uh, what one key thing would you like to say to them uh, as we're finishing off our, uh, our podcast tonight? Uh, and uh, why don't I start with uh, Janet Reynolds. Janet, uh, what one message would you like to give uh, our, uh, our patients? Thanks, I finally, I finally feel like I drew the long straw because I get to go first and uh, pick the most obvious answer. Um, I want all our patients to know that we're here for you. You can call us first. We may ask you to go to the self-assessment online. We may suggest you need to call 811 uh, to obtain COVID testing. Um, but we're here for you. So please call us first. We're here to meet all your healthcare needs. Thanks. And I would uh, do a big ditto to that. Um, Wendy Keller. Uh, yeah, I would just like to say to all our uh, female pa CVFP patients, um, even though a lot of your concerns, you may think they're routine, uh, contraception or your IUD insertion, or pregnancy plans uh, to reach out and uh, to book an appointment either by phone or video. And, uh, and we can certainly talk about any of your concerns. Excellent. And uh, Karen Siegel. Thanks, Rick. I'm gonna say the same thing first, which is yes, we are here for you. Please call us, email us, whatever suits you best. Um, and also please, as we come up to Easter and other holidays, keep following our public health advice and we'll get through this. Thank you. Uh, Nurse Cheryl, um, uh, a pearl that you have, uh, and somebody's got to mention hand washing, but I, mm -hmm. honestly, you choose your own pearl. Go for it, Cheryl. Loved me that one. So please uh, hand wash. Oh, it's, am I, can you hear me? You're good, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you love that one to me. Please hand wash 20 seconds, sing your favorite birthday song, whatever you need to do to get through your 20 seconds. Remember your thumbs and between your fingers and we just know that you're very important to us. We miss you like crazy, but we can't wait to see you back after this is all done healthy and ready to move on with life. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, it, it is uh, as much as, um, as virtual care has lots of benefits at a time like this. Um, and uh, as much as uh, um, this is the right thing to do and it's very efficient, um, really, we do miss that personal contact, don't we? Uh, writing the happy sticks and the, uh, mm -hmm. and the hugs and all that other stuff. So uh, it'll be nice to uh, be nice to get back uh, to those days. Uh, see, this is I get rambling and I forget who I haven't asked. Uh, 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 Ian, that's right, that uh, lovely brogue. Uh, uh, Ian, the pearl that you would like to leave with. You know, Rick, I, I, I do sound like a broken record uh, at times. My poor wife has to, to listen to, to all of this, but uh, social, social distancing does not have to mean social isolation. You know, we're, had, had this happened 15 years ago, this would have been so much more challenging, but the internet makes the world a smaller place. So please reach out to those family members you haven't spoken to in a while. Call them on FaceTime, set up a Skype date, talk to them on Zoom. You can get so many people together on Zoom for free and just have you know that 15 family of 15 that wants to have Easter together. You can all sit in different rooms of different houses and you all sit and talk to each other. Please, we've got enough social isolation in our community already. All of us stop, uh, deal with it on, a, on mostly most days, I would say. Um, so don't don't let it happen. Talk to each other. Um, we're all in this together, and we'll get through it. So don't worry. Good. My director said, "Do not forget Wendy Stefanik." Wendy. Uh, okay. I would say, you know what? We're we are really truly all in this together. We all have a role to play in this in this fight. Use your family and friends as your support network. Find your your outlet at home, physically distanced from others, whatever it may be. 
to get yourself through every day, one day at a time. And if you're struggling, call us as, as everybody before me has said, we are here, we will, we will help you with resources, we'll do whatever it takes. Thanks, our fearless leader, leader uh, Shauna. Echo what everybody else has said. I think the last thing I would remind people about is the 10 tips that you've mentioned several times tonight. Um, those are really important tips in a time like this, and they're actually posted on our website. So we'll continue to post resources there for you. Um, but if you head to our website and at the top of the menu, click on COVID-19, you'll find those tips there. So if you haven't read them yet, please go give them a read and practice them. Thanks very much. And before I give my pearls, uh, I want to um, give a shout out and thanks to uh, Casey Miller, uh, uh, Dr. Miller, who uh, has been furiously typing responses as well. Uh, Lynn Gillis, thanks, Lynn. Uh, appreciate you joining us and uh, also adding to the chat um, Esmond, Amy, uh, Lori, um, Randy, and if I forgot any of our other team members who are actually live time. Uh, without us bribing them, giving answers and feedback. Uh, again, thanks so much for your uh, ongoing support of patients. So I'll just finish things off with my words to you. Uh, I was at a teleconference uh, uh, this week and um, Christine Lalo, who's a, a colleague in the south part of uh, Calgary, um, medical director, um, she looked at us and said, guys, we've got this, uh, we will survive this, this will be behind us. Uh, we're entering a brave new world, uh, but we're going into this crisis with great strength. Your medical home is here for you. Uh, the faith that you have uh, will, will uh, and the good medical advice and public health advice uh, is our strength at these times. So thank you very much for joining us. Keep an eye open in your emails uh, for more support from Crowfoot and another one of these. Thanks to all the people behind the scenes, Trevor behind the camera, uh, and thanks all of you for your great comments and excellent questions. Uh, be safe, everyone, and, uh, and uh, we'll be in touch.